The 28th United Nations Conference of Parties on Climate Change, COP28, will begin in United Arab Emirates, Dubai, on November 30, 2023, that's tomorrow, and run through to December 12. Now, the meeting this year, we hear, will center around how the cleaner energy could be the focus of the entire globe. How much would Nigeria be participating in this year's uh, COP? And in what ways do we intend to impact the world positively to ensure that we also benefit from the gathering? Remember in 20, uh, the COP27, that was for last year, there was a resolution that established and operationalized the loss and damage fund. Now, if you look through the papers today, President Bola Tinubu was actually reminding the United States as well as European Union to make good of the promise of $100 billion uh, meant to really push for the dream. Now, what in, in, in what ways will Nigeria participate at COP28 and what will be our, our gains this year? We have uh, that will be joining us virtually on the show. He's already in Dubai. That's our resource person there. Ola Mideo Gwade, who is the Program Manager, Corporate Accountability and Public Participation Africa, Kappa. He's here already. Ola Mideo, good morning to you. Good morning and thanks for having me. My and name is Ola Mideo Gwade. Oh, Gwade, yes. I guess you're three hours ahead of us. Yes, that's right. Okay, so uh, we would have loved to have you live on News Hub tomorrow when the summit actually opens proper. But tell us, what's going on there at the moment? Uh, so at the moment, uh, here in Dubai, you see delegates from across the world trooping in in their numbers uh, with the aim of getting badge for access. Uh, this was after the initial acknowledgement sent to delegate by United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change called the UNFCCC Secretariat. So what you see happening right now is delegates from Africa, from Asia, from all around the world, tripping into the Health Positive Center, that's the venue of the COP28, to get into their badge without this badge of course, they still access. So that's what is happening right now. You cited the Nigerians' store or our shed or our space. What, what, what can you see there? Yeah, well, of course, the Nigerians are here in their numbers. Africans are here in their numbers. And like I did also mention, it's a convergence of, of the world. So you see virtually every country represented. And then by the time the event starts fully tomorrow, we see Nigeria, we expect Nigeria to have a pavilion of itself where uh, countries' matters will be discussed and then countries' issues will be deliberated and advanced in the floor for onward negotiations. So as it is now, we have the heavy presence of Nigeria, just like every other country uh, in the world. President uh, Kashim Shetima seems to be at the front front for Nigeria this time. It's definitely his first time out as the vice president of the country and would definitely be relaying what Nigeria stands for with regards to climate action in the world. He's saying that uh, the country's vision and expectation for COP28 will include in increased climate action on many fronts, particularly increased and accessible climate financing. And one may not be able to divorce that from what the president said this morning in the papers, that look, EU, US, you promised $100 billion to fix the climate. Where's the money? So is that what you see our, our country really pushing for, or even much more at COP28 this year? Uh, well, thank you very much for that. And it's also good to state uh, here that uh, the $100 billion you mentioned it's just one of the many commitments made. And uh, the, the, the funds are not coming, so to say, and that is why you see this renewed agitation for the release of this fund. This fund was agreed upon since COP15 in Paris. And then as we speak with you, developing nations who are solely responsible for these infractions have failed, I mean, deliberately to deliver on the release of this fund. So when you hear our government calling for a renewed you know agitation for this force to be released i think they are justified but i also think it's beyond that should there have been a sincere approach to the release of this fund maybe the quest for loss and damage would not have been made but as i speak with you these funds are, are not being released but then also because it is not mandatory it seems to be a a a, a, a deliberate attempt by these uh, guys responsible for this infraction to delay response and also to deny africa 
what should be his entitlement. That, that's very interesting. Now, my colleague Ben is uh, with us uh, from Port Harcourt. I'm sure that he also has some questions for you. Ben? Yeah, thank you so much. Let me ask you this very salient question. What's, how much does Nigeria contribute to global warming? That's quite interesting. Uh, but then, if existing literatures are anything to go by, the whole of Africa contributes less than 4% to global emission. And then, less than 4% to global emission. So we are dealing with China, we are dealing with America, we are dealing with Canada. I mean, all combined contributes about 98%. So, and then, this same Africa bears the biggest part. As evidenced by the seasonal changes in our weather pattern, flooding down south, invasion, caused by the full enhancement because their their farmlands are now you know drying up. Africa continues to bear the front, but then the whole of Africa combined contributes less than you know four percent if the features from IPCC is anything to provide. And I think it's even far less far less than that. Well, our bone of contention here is the priorities for Nigeria. That's exactly what it is. So we're looking at uh, the emission target for Nigeria. What, what do you know the emission target for Nigeria? So as contained in our indices, but then our indices are highly influenced, and I must be sincere with you, indices are the national economic contribution. We had aimed that by year 2030, Nigeria should be half targets, you know, in reaching its, you know, indices emission target. And then when I, I say this without honesty, because that is what the document says, but then you see a document <coughs> that clearly conveys the interest and the wish of the West. And I'll tell you why. The same government of Nigeria says that by 2027, we should be done with gas. And the same government mm. says by 2030, we should be flying on the wings of gas. So we have a contradiction, some sort of, from the policy statement of government. So, but as it is, and as it is contained in our policy document called the NDCs and the National uh, National Climate Change Act passed just in 2021, by 2020, 2030, Nigeria should be up its emission target reduction. And that's by 30% as quoted in this document. But then the realities on ground is quite different from what our projections are and i think that's why compassion around this document and how serious or sincere the government is to be tabled at this point in time so how much of harm has this emissions done to the nigerian climate a lot of harm my brother <laughs> a lot of harm you know uh while we were growing up we have what we call a standard geography topic or textbooks or, or curriculum as the case may be it is normally rain between april and november but now in nigeria and in every part of africa you don't know when it will rain or when the rain will stop, I mean, falling. You don't know when the sun will stop and when to go to the farm. So when you go to the farm in the east, in the northeast, you see farmers complaining of seasonal changes that they can't explain. When you come to the west, you see flooding that people cannot explain. And that's why you have increase in food prices. And that's why you have invasion, like I did mention earlier. The northern farmers who are literally nomadic, we have to come down south in search for greener pastures to feed their herds. And in coming down south, they come with force and invasion. And that's why you have these clashes between you know, tribes and uh, people across the country. So evidently, in Nigeria, and not just in Nigeria, in Africa as a whole, there is a heavy, uh, there's a heavy evidence of you know, climate change that continues to you know, take people off their feet and, and then make our coping capacity now seems to be fully exhausted. Looking at unimplemented policies about climate change and about emissions as well, some of which you've talked about, if finally COP I mean, 28 does something and the funds have been released, do you see willpower from our leaders to actually implement and use the funds judiciously? Okay, thank you very much. And I think that's why the cooperation around loss and damage uh, seems to be very, very important. Now, the GGA fund that you rightly mentioned, the 100 billion US dollars, which is of course part of the fund that was promised, not the entire sum anyway. Uh, gives entire discretion to the government to manage. And what this means is that government still determines, you know, what goes into what. And we don't want to talk about the history of government handling funds in Africa and in Nigeria, you know, specifically. So now the quest for loss and damage become very important. Uh, and that's why you have resistance from the West, particularly America, who are also insisting that this loss and damage should be hosted and housed in the World Bank so that they can continue to influence the, the, the dispensation and the usage of this fund. So now, when the loss and damage fund becomes fully operational as we are envisaging and as we are expecting, as we are expecting here in COP28, it gives power to the community to determine infraction that they are suffering 
and also to have an input as to what these funds should address. And that's a major shift from the norm. The GGA is entirely at the discretion of the government to administer the loss and damage as an element of input from the community. And then when you look at the history of projects in Africa, the reason why projects fail in Africa is because people don't have a say into what their plights are. And it's quite they are funny. But now, um, my organization and a couple of others in Africa have been able to work extensively as frontline communities, and we have gathered what the concerns are. And these concerns can only be administered with the input of the people who are suffering this plight. So the, the status quo will be maintained if elements of inclusion are not introduced. And that's why they are dictating that communities who are bearing this brunt in Niger Delta, in Nayetoro, in Nigeria, in Taveta, in Cameroon, in Kambele, in, uh, in, in Taveta, in, in Kenya, in Kambele, in Cameroon, should have a say as to how these funds are being administered, are being administered or we stand the risk of you know having government to still decide on what you know goes to where and how and then of course we return back to the status quo. Well, I mean, you know it's very interesting it's anyway, uh, for the first time in a very long time Africa is now at the forefront of something that's inimical to the world health or you know issues. For the first time we're just cutting about four percent uh, contributing to uh, global climate change and what have you. But now, you mentioned something a while ago, for instance, on the concerns that, uh, for instance, how Nigeria could really maximize potentials uh, that are inherent in what COP28 might bring, especially in the need to ratify all frameworks, the global framework, along with ours, perhaps even within the Africa uh, region. Oh, what are you seeing? What are you looking forward to? And what would you, if you had your way, proposed to the government. Okay, like we have always you know, done, and as we we'll continue to do, uh, we do hope that this COP28 would you know, shift the conversation uh, uh, and the tag on Africa being beggarly. We are not asking for charity. Like I did mention, the whole of Africa contributes just about you know, 4%. So where we are asking for reparation, where we are asking for commensurate compensation for climate injustices that we are not responsible for as Africa, uh, we are not asking for charity. We are just asking that the West, who are responsible, the global North, who are responsible for this infraction, you know, commit and fully commit to, you know, releasing the funds that have been earmarked for them to release. And then we are talking about the funds that continue to be there. So we, are, we want a stop to the global emission, and this will not be possible until and unless the West that are responsible for this emission you know, cut emission at source. We all know that oil has done more harm you know, than good, if at all any good, to our society. This same West are saying we should go the way of renewable, but you see their presence in the shores of Africa, in the shores of Nigeria, heavy. You know, they still continue to expand their business frontier in, in investment in foresight business and foresight wealth. So we want to stop to this. The emission will continue to increase. Africa is not a sinking dam. We are not a sacrificial zone. We are not supposed to be bearing the brunt of a crisis that we are not responsible for. As we want them to, com to commit to releasing these funds, we also want them to put a stop to what is responsible for the emission at large. But unfortunately, and I say unfortunately with all sense of responsibility, African leaders don't seem to understand what the issues are. You see them advancing for immediate liquid uh, liquidity asking for money to come so that our dams can continue to serve as sinks, you know, you know, for this emission. Sequestration, uh, carbon uh, coming to Africa, we have the resources to house them, simply because we want the immediate cash. But then the African communities continue to bear this burden. So our messages are very clear, and it is to put a stop, a permanent stop to emission by cutting emission at source, and also to demand that our quest for climate finance is not based on charity. We are asking for what is due. We are okay. asking for liabilities to be paid, infractions that have been committed years and years to be attended to. And unfortunately, if they are not attended to, as we are speaking with you right now, gases are still being fled on the shores of the Niger Delta, Ayatollah communities on the verge of extinction, and people are talking about option and renewable. So we are dealing with the people who we cannot really trust entirely. And like I did mention earlier, if commitment in the global government has been met, maybe not talking about loss and damage, but because of sincere and prolonged, age-long insincerity from the West. That's why we are still struggling with them to, to deal you know, with the challenges that okay. we are responsible for. So we have two messages clearly. Oil should be left in the ground, emission cut at source, and then 
the ability should not be reduced to char charity. It is our right as African, and we are here for that. It's serious business for that. Okay. Olamide, uh, well spelled, uh, spelled out. And one would say, of course, Africa really deserves that uh, <laughs> some of the reparation, but then we need the compensation for all the deeds against us. But then, how do you reconcile these two uh, extremes? Africa is looking forward to really asking the West that would, up until now, even as we speak, take raw materials from here back to their countries, then, you know, do all they have to do, then sell back to us. We're asking they come to situate their uh, companies in our countries. We want them to locate them. We want them to bring out their countries the, the industries here so that that will bring about employment opportunities for our people. So if they're dealing with environmental issues occasioned by emissions, carbon emissions, that would mean, on another hand, that Nigeria and the other African countries are asking for such as well. So if this is the dream that comes true, perhaps in the next two, three, five years, Africa may be contributing more than 4% to global uh, you know, uh, pollution compared to what we have today. So if this is our dream, how do we look forward to prevent that while still trying to get foreign direct investment, especially PR companies bringing the companies to work in our country or located in our countries so that we can maximize all the opportunities there? Well, thank you very much. But then, uh, yes, house is a struggling economy and hailing one at that. Uh, but then we have renewable energy options that could be invested in. Now we are talking about investments from fossil fuel that continue to contribute to global emissions. Nigeria has a lot of them. Nigeria has, you know, in its abundance, access to solar infrastructure or solar assets, so to speak. These same guys that can come with their millions and invest in options that are not destroying our environment and our ecosystem. So it's quite clear and it's very simple. But you see them coming heavily to expand on their fossil fuel business at the expense of our aquatic environment and at the expense of our marine uh, environment, like I did mention, and of course, the ecosystem as a whole. And then when they are leaving, they divest and hand over this mess to local industries and local entities to continue to bear the brunt. If you go to a good land, I mean, nothing welcomes you there. If you go to Ayetoro, an oil producing community, nothing welcomes you there. But relics and pains from people who continue to envy the past. This is what we are talking about. If you want to bring your direct investment to Africa, yes, welcome. But consider renewable options that will have no impact on the environment. Because we hold the environment a duty of care. Whatever it is that you take from the environment must be replaced. If you don't replace, the environment will fight back. And then if you go to their country, they've, they've covered up the space to allow them fully protected from the mess they are covering elsewhere, they are causing elsewhere. So when, when, we, when we drive this investment like we so need, because we are a dependent economy, so to speak, we don't produce what we consume. <laughs> so if we want them to keep coming with their investment, let us open the door to renewables. We have the dams, we have the water bodies, we have the hydropowers, we have solar, we have wind infrastructure that are begging for attention and begging for investment. So let them channel this investment into this aspect and not on the aspect that continue to, you know, cause existential threats or crises to our people, particularly those of the first time community. Okay, well, thank, thank you so much, Olamide. Question before we move on. You said the priorities of African countries are to make sure one of the priorities is actually uh, to make sure that they do not ask or they do not make it feel like it's some kind of a compensation what is the right of the african countries because of the so much of missions that have been done by these world powers that have actually affected the climatic nature of ours now is there a globally accepted written down a legal framework that if they do not as it were they can be sued and to where as it were yeah, that's a very brilliant question. And that is what the loss and damage now is attempting to address. I did mention earlier that we are dealing with the United States of America. We are dealing with China. We are dealing with India. We are dealing with Russia. These guys combined contribute close to 90 something percent of the global emission. So it, it is not binding on them. It is just like them helping us. So we have to move from that trend of being beggarly as Africa. We have to shift our conversation to asking for what is right. As it is now, to be honest with you, it is not mandatory, it is not binding, 
It is something that is done purely on the basis of moral. And then we are asking that this should be on the basis of moral. Because when you come to the front line communities in Africa, people dying there are dying because you guys continue to pollute the environment that they're not responsible for. So the loss and damage is trying to shift the attention to making it now more forceful and mandatory. But then we are still dealing with the influence of America who continue to insist that this bond should be domiciled under the World Bank. And then you know what World Bank is. World Bank is an instrument of the US to continue to influence, you know, who gets what and why. So mm -hmm. we are dealing with a powerful structure with the people who seem to know the game. And then unfortunately, our, our leaders in Africa are being caught in their trap, asking for immediate funds to address immediate and present liquidity uh, infrastructure infractions. But these infractions continue to happen. So what happened to those whose livelihood were gone and those who have to shift their base, who have lost their ancestral homes, whose culture are totally evaded? So that's what loss and damage is trying to address. But unfortunately, like I did mention, we are dealing with powers that be and powers we intend to overcome. Well, thank you so much. So it is expected that Africa will push in this topic to make a legal framework to that effect. Now, I'm asking, first of all, these things are done by lobbying. Was there a pre-meeting before the COP28 by African leaders, African representatives, that this is one front that we are leading? And how much of lobbying have they made with other countries in order to be able to achieve this legal framework and if that is if hard to work? Yeah, this question is what we continue to ask our leaders. Uh, just in September, there was the maiden edition of the African Climate Summit held in Nairobi. Uh, by privilege, I attended. And then the outcome of this you know, meeting clearly you know, uh, underscored the importance of immediate liquidity. And that was what President Ruto said, that Africa has a sink, Africa has a dam to accommodate you know, you know, carbon in exchange of money. But as it is now, about 17 African head of states signed into that Nairobi declaration. There's a question about the quorum anyways. But then, as far as Africa is concerned, and just yesterday I was looking at the document of the African Group of Negotiators, the bodies responsible for making negotiation on behalf of Africa, because it's also good to state that African countries don't have the right of say, except through AGN. AGN is the African Group of Negotiators. So I looked into their statement and their expectation for COP28, I begin to struggle with, you know, what their what their what, what their positions are. It's also clearly aligned to that of the the outcome of the African Climate Summit, and that is asking for immediate liquidity, asking that commitment be made for GGA with less emphasis on loss and damage. So it seems that we are dealing with a people who seems to have been bought, you know, completely uh, by the ways that we are dealing with. So it's quite unfortunate. But as far as the civil society in Africa is concerned, we have a position uh, that clearly states that this is not something to be negotiated. This is something that has come to stay, and we are committed to fighting through uh, in this COP. Thank you so much, Olamide Ogunlade. Because of time, that's the much we can take. And of course, we look forward to meeting you tomorrow when uh, the conference starts properly. And of course, you give us updates about what is happening there. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thank you very much, my brother. That's my prayer, Holmes.